keeping seniors engaged with society, and help for homeowners as cold weather sets in. Details in this week's Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Keeping Minnesota's growing senior population connected with society has been a priority for Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor. According to a 2012 report by the Met Council, the senior population in the Twin Cities area will double between the years 2010 and 2030. It's projected to grow from 307,000 seniors to 770,000. We sat down with Lieutenant Governor Yvonne Pretner Solon to discuss her initiatives to help those who are retired and to help others plan for their golden years. What I wanted to do was to profile seniors, recognizing that they are a wealth of information, a, a wealth of experience, um, that they have still a lot to offer. And by keeping seniors engaged, and by continuing to value them, we also help to maintain their health. Because as long as they're engaged, then they're going to be taking better care of themselves and they're going to be more concerned about staying active. Have you found it challenging to try to reach this particular demographic? No, they're very responsive and they love it. They love it. I think that they're hungry to just be included and involved. And I think that, I mean, I speak of my own population as a senior that um, we recognize that we still have a lot to, to, to offer. People are living longer, and so we want people, while they're living longer, to live healthier and to have a better quality of life, to remain more viable. And so with the expansion of the senior linkage line, have you found that it's um, grown exponentially in the number of calls it receives, the information it gives, and what are some of the real, the key issues that concern seniors right now? Well, People call about, first of all, it's a three-phase line. So the first thing was to connect people with government services. The second phase was to connect um, seniors with um, volunteer opportunities, whether they want to volunteer in the community or whether they might need somebody to help them with some services around their home or, or um, to provide some personal care for them. And then the third area was to help seniors stay connected with the employment opportunities. And it's people over the age of 50 who've had the hardest time weathering this most recent recession and staying employed. And we do find that because seniors are living longer, they want to stay employed longer. Maybe not in the same career that they had their whole life, but they want to stay active and involved in earning some extra income because they have longer years to, many more years to support themselves. Speaking of income, you also are a proponent of and trying to educate younger people about planning for retirement. Now, according to a recent Gallup poll, 90% of Americans don't have enough saved for retirement. 45% have nothing saved at all. How important do you think it is for people to save for retirement? Well, for retirement and for, and for their long-term care, we do know that 70% of the people over the age of 65 will at some time in their life require some long-term care services. And those services can be very costly, whether it's in-home services or in some type of a facility, whether it's hospital or nursing home or some type of assisted living facility. Um, we also know that people have to start making plans for modifications to their homes if they decide they want to stay in their homes, whether it's um, just identifying that they can have a bedroom, a, a kitchen, and a bathroom all on the same floor, um, or finding some means of being able, uh, ramps or something to help them negotiate stairs as they get older. Um, people who, uh, as people age, we want them to have, to appreciate and, uh, and enjoy a quality of life that um, is what they expect. And uh, what we find is that many people have not thought about aging and about long-term care. And when you ask them about you know, what will happen if they get ill as they get older, people say, I don't know, or they say, the state will take care of me. Or, or whatever, but what we do know is because, as I said, the senior population is growing exponentially, that um, the, the state can no longer afford to take care of everybody, that it becomes unsustainable and will bankrupt the state unless people start planning for their own 
aging. And so the message might resonate with a considerable portion of the population. However, with so many people concerned about the economy, median incomes have gone down every year for the last five years. With so many families living paycheck to paycheck, how do you take this goal and make it achievable for those people? Um, well, again, a three-phase process. <laughs> the first phase is educating people to start planning at an earlier age because the earlier you start planning for your later years, the less you have to, the less costly it is on a, on a regular basis. If you wait until you're already in retirement, it will be more costly for you to plan for your later years. So we want to be, we want people thinking about it and we want people talking about it. We want people talking with family members and, and, uh, and because it's something that we just avoid. Um, we also, the second phase of our, of our plan is to look at products and to identify products that are more affordable and the products that are reliable, that uh, protect the consumer, that, so that if they make an investment in a product that it will be available for them when they need it as, as they age. And um, we've had a, com a subgroup that has been working on this for the past year, and they've identified about 14 different types of products, uh, a variety of things from long-term care insurance to personal savings to um, uh, Medicap policies to um, um, reverse mortgages and some many new, more convertible types of, of um, products that can serve a variety of different um, functions depending on whether a person needs long-term care or retirement income or, or maybe to leave for their heirs after they pass on. Thank you so much for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your time as always. Okay, thank you, Julie. weapons in the Capitol was among the items taken up at this hearing of the Advisory Committee on Capital Area Security. The members debated the topic for roughly an hour without coming to any final consensus. If we're not going to ban firearms in the Capitol complex, and I don't suspect that we will, then it seems to me one thing you could do to tighten it up would be to um, require someone, if they're going to carry, to notify the commissioner. Uh, that the um, the document would have to be, would have to show that uh, um, that their permit is up to date, um, and I think a more stringent policy would be to say that it, you can carry your permit, but you have to notify the commissioner the day you're bringing the the, the firearm into the into the complex. We would certainly um, like to see something that is a little more uh, formal as a process for notification, um, not even from the standpoint of both from the standpoint of understanding who the permitted carriers are, but also in giving us clarification who are not permitted carriers coming into the into the complex. I don't think just because we, we would like to keep this capital open and don't, uh, some of us don't believe we should ban weapons in the, in the capital for law-abiding permit holders, that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't uh, think this capital needs to be secure. Uh, and there are many ways to do that. The Senate and House bonding committees are currently touring the state separately as they sift through $2.8 billion in funding requests. Chair of the Senate Capital Investment Committee, Leroy Stump, says he believes these tours are invaluable and he intends to re-examine the debt capacity process. The problem is, is that we have other projects that have kind of used up some of that capacity, such as the Viking Stadium or the Stillwater Bridge or a number of other projects that have kind of come in the back door through, a, through not the bonding process through our capital investment committee, but have come in through the tax committee or other, other means. So we have to look at uh, and, and I'm looking forward uh, as Representative Houseman and I and hopefully the governor can sit down and leadership and see if there isn't a, a way for us 
to re-examine the capacity that the state of Minnesota has. House Capital Investment Committee Chair Representative Alice Hausman recently sat down with us to talk about her committee's bonding tour and how she prioritizes bonding projects. How do these visits impact the final package? Yes, we've been northwest, northeast, southeast, uh, the metro area, and we're just about to finish uh, southwest and central. And we really believe uh, that traveling the state and reaching every corner of the state is essential. Um, when I write the bonding bill, it should be clear to everyone in the state that I've been fair, that I've been fair to every region. When you're spending taxpayer money, uh, that uh, you, you want to assure that um, uh, that it's an equitable distribution of taxpayer dollars, but also uh, that they're the, they're, that we're making the right decision on every line of that budget, that, um, that this in, is infrastructure that benefits the state. We recently spoke with Senate Chair Leroy Stumpf, and he stated that essentially asset preservation tends to be his guiding principle in selecting the projects. What's, what's your guiding principle? Well, um, I uh, look at it somewhat differently. I ask myself, what infrastructure has to be in place in order for the state to thrive, for us to be economically competitive? And when I ask that question, uh, it's clear that higher ed is always at the top of the list. That is about the future. It's about research and development. Uh, it's about the smart classrooms and laboratories that are going to train the workforce of the future. And uh, so it's about our future and it keeps us economically competitive. Higher education is at the top. And then all of the other infrastructure that's essential for healthy communities and for um, business and industry to thri thrive. And that is, um, there are some transportation issues that are in the capital investment bill. The uh, ports in Red Wing and Winona and Duluth uh, are important to us. Um, public safety and corrections are important, wastewater infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, so I ask the question, what infrastructure has to be in place in order for the economy to thrive? He also stated that he has some concerns about the debt capacity that's been used, using his words, backdoor methods coming from committees other than capital investment. He'd like to see if there's a way to re-examine this debt capacity. Well, I, over the years, have been uh, quite a broken record. I just believe that building should, should come to the capital investment committee. Um, and that's the only way we can measure and determine, are we being fair? Are we, um, to, to each sector also, not only every region of the state, but each sector of the bill. Uh, so I have always said I thought building ought to uh, happen in capital investment. Uh, there's another reason to do that. Um, when you do it through appropriation bonds, uh, as, w as we're doing uh, with the um, uh, legislative, office, legislative building. office building, it costs more. So if we had done that with general obligation bonds, that building would cost less. And I made an argument on the last night of session when I heard about the building uh, that we ought not to be doing it in the tax bill and we not, ought not to be doing it with that funding source, but that instead we should be doing it with general obligation bonds. It's a less expensive way of doing it. But um, I agree with Representative Stumpf that, uh, Senator Stumpf, that um, um, because we have debt service guidelines, uh, we want to be sure that all of the long-term debt uh, is focused on our highest priorities. When you begin to do it in other bills, it's harder to do that priority setting that he and I do. And you spoke a little bit, using your words, priorities. It appears as though you and Senator Stumpf have essentially the same priorities, maybe just a different manner of, of ranking them. So how do you reconcile these when it comes to sitting down and... Uh, he and I have already had uh, really quite a number of conversations, and I think we're on the same wavelength about a number of the, of the big items. There are still questions to be answered about a, a few of them. And so I think the reconciling them uh, between uh, the two of us will uh, will be a fairly easy proposition. Uh, we Starting conversation early and working together early, I think, um, is, is a good thing. Now, what's your response to the argument that's made continuously uh, by primarily from the GOP that large bond and bills aren't necessary, nor do they create significant numbers of jobs? Do you buy into this argument? And twofold, would you support a billion dollar bonding bill this session? Well, there are some people who say we do bonding bills in order to put construction workers to work. That would not be the reason to do it. It's a nice uh, a side effect. Um, we, we decide what infrastructure is important to us for 
uh, for the economic health of the state. And uh, when we build them, uh, obviously we put people to work while those uh, jobs are, are uh, while those projects are being um, built. But that's not why you would do a bonding bill. Uh, so I, I just have always sort of dismissed that argument. It's not an argument I make. You don't do it to put construction workers to work. They're going to have jobs as a result of the bill, but it's not the reason for it. As to the size, um, I think that argument has been going on for a few years now, and it has not served the state well, because it has served to hold down the um, size of those bills. And as a result, you can see the lack of investment everywhere. Everyone's feeling it. The higher ed campuses are, when we tour them, uh, there are buildings that should have been torn down. There are laboratories that should have been replaced. There's a science building at Metro State that should have been built. Um, the, the, the more we uh, argue that we need small bonding bills, uh, the greater harm we do uh, to all of the infrastructure around the state because we begin to have that backlog. And uh, so it's, it's an argument that, that really, I think, has been counterproductive. Okay, Representative Hausman, as always, thank you for joining us. We'll track your legislation as it's crafted and as it goes to conference committee, of course. We'll look forward to that. Former Republican State Representative Jim Knobloch says he will go to court to try and halt the construction of a new $90 million legislative office building situated near the state capitol. In fact, while my lawsuit only names the Senate office building, there are several other provisions in the bill that also seem to violate the single subject provision. And one of them is actually a prevailing wage provision for projects in the Rochester Destination Medical Center, which appears similar to what was struck down. Senator Scott Newman joined the bonding tour and he joins us now to talk a little bit about what he saw and what he anticipates in 2014. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Well, thank you for inviting me. Let's begin with the bonding bill. It's expected to come in at about a billion dollars in 2014. $2.8 billion were requested. In your opinion, do the apparent needs of Minnesota outweigh any opposition to the size of the bill? Well, I think you have to kind of put things in perspective a little bit. There are certain needs that uh, it is in the best interest of the state of Minnesota as a whole to bond for. And then there are other, uh, we'll call them needs, you know, uh, very earnest local needs where the folks uh, are, are very sincere about their requests, but uh, truly aren't what I would consider uh, projects of statewide or regional interest. And so somehow you have to, you have to come up with the dividing line on that. Uh, I think we're very fortunate in having uh, Senator Stumpf as the chairman. Uh, he, he is an absolute gentleman and I believe that he is going to, albeit come under some political pressure eventually, I think he's going to do his absolute best to put together a bonding bill that is the best for the state of Minnesota as a whole. And you recently went on the tour. What was your impression of the site visit? Visits? Well, I've been on three of them now so far. Uh, three different parts of the state. We've got two more to go. Uh, my impression is this, is that uh, th there are certain projects that we, we must bond for. Uh, and, Such and as? St. Cloud uh, Prison. Uh, turns out, and I didn't know this, uh, St. Cloud Prison is the intake and outtake facility for the entire corrections facility. And when we went in there and we looked at uh, the, the area that these prisoners, some of which are frankly dangerous, uh, that they are moving through, uh, we simply have to improve that facility. Um, uh, I think that Moose Lake, for instance, has got a real problem with their, with their uh, command center, the, the, the sort of the nerve center, and uh, they're going to have to fix that. And then there are other projects that, uh, uh, all, again, albeit uh, the local folks are very serious and very courteous about and uh, very earnest in their request, simply in my estimation do not, do not raise or rise to the level of a project uh, being of statewide significance, which is really what our 
responsibility is. Senator Stump says that asset preservation is a top, top priority for him as he creates his bill. Representative Alice Hausman says that higher ed tends to outweigh other areas and that includes research and development for her. What do you think needs to be in a bonding bill? Uh, projects of, of statewide significance. That's what I think is, is uh, going to be the litmus test. But now, what it, oh, okay, now, go ahead. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, asset preservation. I think Senator Stumpf is, is just absolutely bang on. We, we as a state own lots and lots of different buildings in various arenas, various agencies. And once we own them, we, we are obligated to take care of them. The best example I can give you is your capital. Uh, we uh, came up with the money necessary to fix our capital. And so it's called HEPR, you know, as I'm sure that you are aware of, and we have to preserve those assets. So I do agree with Senator Stump on that. What are your thoughts on the recent lawsuit on the, to the new legislative office building? That lawsuit claims that that building should have been a part of the bonding bill, not the tax bill. That brings up a, a, a really a good question and one that Senator Stump is legitimately worried about, and that's bonding capacity. Uh, it's to me, uh, you know, as a as a uh, reforming lawyer, I think it's really an interesting legal question because to pass a bonding bill you have to have 60 percent, whereas to pass a tax bill you have to have a simple majority. So uh, is there a legal issue in there that is legitimate? In my estimation, yes. How the Supreme Court will ultimately sort it out, I don't know. But Senator Stumpf is justifiably concerned that other committees, committees other than capital investment, are burning up the bonding capacity of this state through other committees, which in reality should go through the Capital Investment Committee. And I think Senator Stump is correct. Senator, we are just about out of time, but I want to ask you, when you talked about some of these local projects, are those necessary so you can get 60% of the votes, a super majority, to represent folks' districts? And do you ever think they'll ever, will they ever really be left out of a bonding bill? Uh, there, there is, in my estimation, unfortunately, that's where the politics be that does come into play. Uh, and I uh, have never been uh, a legislator that favors uh, what, are, what I would consider truly local projects, and I, I doubt that I ever will. But there are exceptions. There are exceptions. Uh, and the, the best example that I could give you would be in the southwest part of the state of Minnesota, they are literally running out of water. And it is at best a regional uh, bonding request that they have put in to help them pipe in water from uh, out from the Missouri River. And what impressed me was the presentation when the, when the, the gentleman who was making the, 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 the request said, look, we're not asking you for money to build a swimming pool or to build a civic arena. We are asking for basic water so that we can uh, so that we can live, and that really kind of puts things into perspective. So I would have to say that it's not a hard and fast rule uh, that local projects never rise to that level. Sometimes they do. Would you support a one billion dollar bonding bill? For the biennium, the answer is yes. Not necessarily for 2014. For the biennium, we have already utilized. Uh, what 130 or 150, 150 million dollars mm -hmm. and the agreement was is that it was a billion for the biennium and I expect that we will hold to that okay well we will track it of course during session Senator Newman thank you so much for joining us thank you very much Cold weather is now upon us, and Commissioner of the Department of Commerce, Mike Rothman, recently sat down with us to talk about some of the programs available through his office that can help homeowners with the cost of updating their homes. We have um, an assistance network throughout the state, uh, so you can have somebody come into the home, take a look at uh, whether or not you're leaking uh, you know, hot air, if you were, uh, your furnaces aren't working properly or they're inefficient or insulation issues like that. Uh, and we found that 
people who are living in, and this is nationwide, so we work with the Department of Energy, uh, and, and we find that the older homes uh, tend to be less energy efficient. They are, you know, putting out a lot of uh, electric energy, gas energy. So what we do is we have folks go into those homes. Uh, we work with agent, local agencies, uh, check to see where we can have savings, and to actually do the changes to the home. And, you know, when that happens, you can lower the energy bill. Uh, you can save dollars over time. And for a lot of folks, particularly low-income people, it does help a lot during wintertime. And I found it interesting in a recent press release that it discussed some of the positive trickle-down impacts outside of just saving money on an energy bill. Job creation is one example. How do you see the, the positive tentacles flowing? Well, it's, it's, uh, you're right. There is job creation. We have, um, through the last three, four years, um, trained and uh, been able to work with installers, people who go into the homes, fix the homes, and they are becoming relatively skilled uh, individuals who can go in and weatherize homes. So there's a, a large number of these people throughout the state of Minnesota that um, not only do the homes get fixed, but there are great jobs to do it. Based on the numbers, there is great need for this on the number of applicants. There is an argument made, however, by many that this doesn't necessarily need to be something that government pays for. It could come from the utilities or the homeowners themselves could, could find ways to pay. Why shouldn't the homeowner make these changes, him, him or herself? Well, it's a very good question. The Department of Energy um, and states have had energy efficiency programs uh, in place for well over 30 years. Low-income individuals, first of all, are typically unable to afford it. Um, they typically are, are at a point where their energy bills are so high that they need any assistance that they can get. And, um, and then for those people who, like myself and others, can afford to do the weatherization ourselves, we, we do that. There are also rebate programs that the utilities, natural gas and electric companies have uh, for everybody to take advantage of. So we encourage people to do that as well. We talked a little bit about the need. Approximately 16,000 families apply each year in Minnesota. A fraction are accepted. Now there's this movement to keep baby boomers in their homes. So how do you think that's going to impact this program in the future? Well, I, you know, as more people stay in the home, obviously, the more people uh, will will need to have homes that are energy efficient. And uh, and particularly because, again, as we were, uh, were talking, it's important to help uh, folks with their budgets and their, their situation. So it just brings the energy bill down. It helps them. And then it helps all of us. Because if we make all of that, that, the individual homes and then all of them together aggregate that, we save energy. We use less energy as a state. And that is a benefit that we we all have and we don't have to build you know another uh, power plant or anything to, to do that so if we're all doing this together it just makes much more sense It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.